Hey everyone, Morgan here. So we're going to be talking about the history of atomic structure today. And this is part of a much bigger unit that we're doing called Atoms and Light. So we're on page one of your new lecture outline. Now we're going to talk a little bit about our major contributors to the ideas of atomic structure. Now we're going to begin with Democritus, who's pictured here on this stamp from Greece. Okay, You've got a guy that was alive, you know, 2,000 plus years ago, okay? And he is the first person that we have saying that atoms were indivisible and constantly in motion. He said that all stuff is made up of smaller particles. Now, we're not going to say that he's the first person to ever have this idea. In fact, he probably wasn't. But he is the first recorded person saying this. And he makes reference in his writings to a guy named Lysippus. Okay, so that could have even been before him. So this model of the atom that Democritus gives us is a small, hard particle with no internal parts. Now, jumping 2,000 or so years forward, we get to a guy named John Dalton. Now, Dalton's work happened over a long period of time, but some of the most significant publications were in 1808. Okay, and he developed what we call the first modern atomic theory and revised it over quite a bit of time. Now, the fundamental theme still to Dalton's theory is that elements are made of tiny particles called atoms. Okay, now the word atom itself has an interesting origin. In Greek, atomos, we would spell it A-T-O-M-O-S, means indivisible or uncuttable. And Democritus had referred to atoms as being atomos, as being uncuttable. So we have kind of uh, modernized the word into atom. Now, atomos does not mean atom, so let's not make that mistake but it was a description of them. So Dalton's theory, elements are made of tiny particles called atoms. Now, there are four parts to his theory that we need to know. The first statement is all atoms of a given element are identical. So if I have a carbon atom and you have a carbon atom, there is really no way to tell them apart. The second statement is that the atoms of a given element are different from those of any other element. Okay, the atoms of different elements can be distinguished from one another by their respective relative weights. At any point you need to, you can pause this to finish writing down any of these statements. Don't worry about that. So, this statement is not 100% true. We now know that you can have carbon atoms that are different from other carbon atoms. Okay, they're still carbon atoms, but we have these things called isotopes. They have different masses. Now, at one point, we actually thought different isotopes were different elements. Third statement, atoms of one element can combine with atoms of other elements to form chemical compounds. And a given compound always has the same relative numbers and types of atoms in it. Now that was our whole second unit this year, how to put together different compounds. And then the fourth statement, atoms can't be created or divided into smaller particles or destroyed in a chemical process. A chemical reaction simply changes the way that atoms are grouped together. Pause if necessary. Get these copied down. Okay, now, one of the big problems that faced people like Dalton and Democritus, for that matter, was that you can't see atoms. 
so we have to study them indirectly. William Crookes invented what you see here in the lower right, which at the time was called a Crookes tube. Now it would probably be referred to as a vacuum tube, or in some cases, even uh, a cathode ray tube. Now you'll notice that there are wires going to either end of the tube that's applying an electric current, and that the inside of the tube is vacuumed out. We remove all the air. And then in some instances, different gases are put in. Okay, uh, these were predominantly complete vacuums. And when you apply an electric current, it runs from one end of the tube to the other, and you can see that as a glowing light. Now, in this case, this is not going perfectly straight because the metal electrodes are not perfectly straight across from each other. But in a lot of the experiments that we're going to be talking about, they were. And it was the deflection of this beam of electricity that was being studied, how much it was moving. Okay? So that's basically electricity visualized running from one end of the tube to the other. J.J. Thompson was one of the first people who actually gave us a good application of a Crookes tube. And the culmination of his work was really published in 1897, okay, in an article called Cathode Rays. Now, generally, textbooks give J.J. Thompson credit of discovering the electron. Now, what he did was he took one of these cathode ray tubes and he applied a field to it by using a very large magnet. And he was able to deflect the stream of electricity, the glowing stream that you saw in the previous slide. And he knew the strength of the magnets and different magnets would deflect that stream different amounts. So what Thompson was able to do with a lot of measurements and repeat experiments was show that the electron, or he, he measured the electron's charge to mass ratio. Not its charge and not its mass, its mass, but the charge to mass ratio. Now this proved that the electron was a particle, okay? Electricity is made up of a string of electrons. That beam that was going through there was a particle. It was actually moving from one end to the other. Now, if it has charge and it has mass, really if it has mass, we know that it has a particle involved. So I like this stamp from Guinea-Bissau uh, because it actually showed one of the tubes that Thompson used in his experiments. Now, Thompson then used this information to describe what he thought an atom was constructed like, what it looked like. And he referred to it with a very British term, calling it the plum pudding model. Now, basically in America, we'd refer to this as a fruitcake, okay? And in the fruitcake, you have the cake part, and then you have pieces of dried fruit interspersed in it. And to Thompson, the pieces of fruit were the electrons over, spread over the rest of the atom, which would be the cake. Now, the term pudding is kind of misused. Uh, it, this is a cultural thing. <laughs> For the British, pudding is a word that means dessert or the after-dinner sweet. It's not what we would refer to as chocolate pudding or a butterscotch pudding or something like that, okay? So, he, it, it's again, it's just a cultural thing about the name. We'd say it was a fruitcake model or even like a blueberry muffin or something along those lines. 
So the entire atom was positive with little spots of negative particles inside it. Now, did Thomson really discover the electron? In my opinion, no. The electron was pretty much discovered by Benjamin Franklin and his experiments with electricity. Electricity is a stream of electrons. So he even, in a sense, named the particle by calling a stream of electrons electricity. And then we changed the name for the individual particle to be the electron. In fact, Thomson didn't even want to use that name at first. He wanted to call it the corpuscle, okay? Uh, but a lot of his colleagues said, no, you really have to pay attention to what Benjamin Franklin did uh, and realized that he discovered it. Now, the stories of the kite experiment are exaggerated in exactly how it occurred. Thompson had a pretty good, uh, Franklin had a pretty good idea what was going to go on. Now, he did these in Philadelphia, and this is actually a picture of the spot where he was doing those experiments that a church sits on it now. He was out in a churchyard at the time, okay? And they've got this nice plaque on the wall there talking about it. Okay. Now, the next thing we should make mention of is a discovery by Henri Becquerel. See, it turns out that not being able to see atoms is a real hindrance in us understanding what's going on. So we needed other techniques. Deflection of that electric current helped, but we also needed what eventually became known as radiation, okay, which has a smaller wavelength than visible light. Now, Becquerel's discovery is very mischaracterized. He turned it into a very good story that it was a happy accident. It really was not an accident. He knew what was going on, and his description made it sound like a wonderful story. So this is a photographic plate, an actual picture of one of Becquerel's photographic plates. Now, if you've ever seen a film camera, film came in rolls wrapped up that you put into the camera and it advanced through and you took photos on different squares on that film. But in the 1890s, film did not come in a roll. It came on just one single plate. Okay, that might be four by four inches or five by five inches, you know, relatively big. And photographic plates were expensive. So Becquerel would not have been wasting them kind of the way he said that it was an accident. What he did was he had plates that were wrapped in a very thick black cloth so no light could get to them. That's the way this was transported. Okay, and he had them in a drawer. Now, he had been doing experiments on a rock known as pitchblende, a uranium ore. And when you hold those rocks, they feel warm to the touch. So he knew that energy was coming out of them. So he put those plates in a drawer with one of those rocks on top of it to see if anything would happen on the photographic plate. And as you can see, there's images of two rocks here where it did happen. Now, he said he just stumbled upon it by accident. Well, there's no reason he would have been developing these very expensive photographic plates that had not been exposed to light unless he thought something was going on. So it was not an accidental discovery. He knew what he was looking for. This just happened to be the proof of it. Okay. Now, interesting enough, I've done some research on this, and it occurred on a Sunday. See, it turned out he had to give a presentation the next day at the university, and he, he wasn't ready. He had to go in and work on the weekend. So he was procrastinating pretty much just like all of you do also. So don't feel quite so bad about that anymore, okay? But he was starting to get pretty desperate about having something to present to help keep his job. So with his discovery of radiation, we now had something that had a very small wavelength 
that we could use to study atoms. Now, there are three major types of radiation. There, there are a lot of other types also, but this is three major ones that we talk about. So let's fill in this table where we'll name them, show you their Greek symbol, what their mass is, their charge, and what type of a barrier we can use to prevent them from moving. Now, the first type is called alpha. This is the Greek letter for alpha, okay? Its mass is about four atomic mass units. Well, it turns out this is the nucleus of a helium atom. So the way that when you look at the periodic table and you see 4.00 grams per mole for helium, if you're dealing with just one atom, it's four atomic mass units. The charge is a two plus, okay? And this is because it is a helium nucleus. We've removed two electrons. And you can actually prevent it from moving with just using a sheet of paper. I mean, you, you do this with balloons. You have helium filled balloons at home, okay? And that keeps them inside. So a typical sheet of notebook paper would prevent this from moving. Now, beta radiation, that's the symbol for beta, very scripty B. Its mass is almost nothing. One over 1,837 atomic mass units. That's tiny. Charge was negative one. But because it's so much smaller, lighter, faster than an alpha particle, you actually need like a one inch sheet of plywood to protect yourself from beta radiation. Let's be honest, it's just an electron. That's what it is. It's just a stream of electrons. Now, gamma radiation, that's its symbol, has no mass. It's not actually a particle. It has no charge. It's not a particle. It's just pure energy. And because of that, you need lead as a barrier. And most of you, I'm sure, have memories of being in the dentist's office and when they do dental x-rays, putting that lead apron over you. Okay. Now, radiation made something called the gold foil experiment possible. Ernest Rutherford, okay, was the first person to do this experiment. And when he was doing it, it was to determine the size of gold atoms. Now, it worked real well. He took a uranium source of alpha particles, put it in a lead box so that he could focus it. And he shot them towards a thin piece of gold foil. And the majority of these alpha particles just went straight through. He detected them by putting a screen up in front of the plate that had a luminescent paint on it. So it would basically just you know, sparkle when hit. Now, the interesting part here is that he def saw deflection. Some of the particles didn't go exactly straight through. And he realized he could measure the size, the radius of a gold atom that way. And it was a very successful experiment. A few years later, a student was asked to repeat the experiment by Rutherford. Rutherford was evaluating, so he wants to see if he could get the same answer. And what happened was the student misunderstood the instructions. And he put the barrier, like you see it in this diagram, going almost all the way around. Now, because of that, he noticed particles that were bouncing backwards. And this was not something that Rutherford had noticed. It happened in his experiment. He just didn't notice it because he didn't have that screen all the way around the thin gold foil. Now, when he showed this to Rutherford, it just became instantly obvious to Rutherford what was going on here, okay? And you have particles that are hitting something in the gold foil and bouncing back. Rutherford made the analogy. It was as if I had take, taken a 15 inch cannon shell, fired it in a piece of tissue paper, and it bounced back. So what could explain this? Well, 
a concept called the nucleus. Okay, it's illustrated really nicely on this stamp from New Zealand. Okay, now what's going on is the atom in Rutherford's mind has a center, and he called this a planetary model, and the center was like our sun, and the majority of the mass of the atom is right there in that center, which we now call the nucleus. Positive charge and some neutrons that they didn't know about for like another 30 years, but they didn't affect anything because they're not charged. So what Rutherford said was the particles that bounce backwards are hitting the nucleus, and since they're positive and the nucleus is positive, they're going to deflect straight back. Okay. The majority of them are going to go straight through because they're not actually getting near the nucleus. That's done nicely in this diagram on the left. And once it kind of hit the edge of the nucleus, or just deflected. So what is the nucleus? Tiny, positively charged, and very massive. So at Rutherford's atomic model, is pretty much like planets orbiting the sun, okay? And you have this ring of electrons, which are like the planets going around the sun, going around the nucleus. Now, one of the reasons that Rutherford came to the idea so quickly was that he was prepped for it. This idea had been proposed by somebody in Japan a little bit earlier, but there was no proof offered of it. Okay, so now we have what we call a planetary model. Now we're going to jump forward a little bit to go to an American named Robert Andrews Millikan. And there are a lot of Millikan schools around the Los Angeles area. There's, there's a Millikan Middle School out in North Hollywood, uh, and then there's a Millikan High School down in Long Beach. Millikan was the first president of Caltech in Pasadena. So he was in Southern California for the you know, entire second half of his life. It's a U.S. stamp with him on it. There actually haven't been any stamps that picture his experiment. Okay. Now, Millikan did what we refer to as the oil drop experiment. And this is what it looks like. This was put together in very much MacGyver fashion. The container was a milk jug, the type that you would carry out to the barn and put underneath the cow and get the milk shot straight into it, so to speak. Now he welded it closed and pulled a vacuum in it, got the air out. He put in an atomizer. Now, to be honest with you, that atomizer was his wife's best perfume bottle. That's really what it was. His first try was with water, and it, it didn't work because the water just evaporated and turned into gas. But then he put in a really high-quality mineral oil, and it ended up working. There are two electric plates in it, and a, a light source that goes in, okay, microscope uh, lens so you can see what's going on. And actually, he needed uh, an x-ray source to uh, actually charge the particles themselves, okay, so that you could see them. Now, as the drops fell through, he timed how long it took them to go between two specific marks. He played around with the charges on the plate, actually suspended the particles, and he had the opinion that the oil drops would have to contain a whole number of electrons. He did not know how many electrons, but he knew there was a whole number of electrons in there. So he kept calculating the charge on the oil drops, and that he got a different answer every time because it was a different number of electrons every time. But what he looked for was a common factor in all those numbers. Now, if we were in the classroom, what I would do for this is I'd actually take a beaker and fill it with marbles all identical marbles. And I'd go up to the first person in the front row and tell them to take out some marbles, and I wouldn't say how many. And they'd pull some out. We'd put that on the balance, the beaker with the leftover marbles, write the number on the board, put the marbles back in. Then the second person in the row would take out some marbles, probably not the same number that the first person took out, and we'd find it's not. 
And we keep doing this over and over again, 10, 20, 30 times, although for Millikan it was about 15,000 times. And eventually a pattern would emerge for the masses that were leaving, okay? And for Millikan, a pattern emerged for what the charges were, the differences in the charges. And that was how he measured the charge on the electron. Now, because J.J. Thompson had given us the charge to mass ratio, he could do some math and actually figure out the mass of an electron also. So some books mistakenly say that Millikan measured the mass of an electron. In reality, he measured the charge on it, and that gave us the mass. Okay. Next, we're going to be looking at a guy back in England this time by the name of Chadwick. Now, Chadwick was not trying to discover new particles. He was just trying to get more precise measurements of protons. And he created his protons in an interesting way. He took helium, alpha particles, bombarded it onto some beryllium. Now, what that produced was carbon and nit uh, a neutron. And as he was measuring these particles, he found that some of the particles that he was detecting didn't have any charge. So at first he started to refer to them as a neutral proton. Okay, and eventually came to the conclusion that what it was was a different particle itself. It had almost the same mass as a neutron, okay, but it was a different particle. What it really turns out to be is a neutron and an electron that have fused together. Okay, so that's a little bit of the history, and I've put some reading up about it also, uh, which can help you with that. If we had unlimited time, uh, I would have actually gone into a lot more detail, because that's about three days worth of lecture, but we just don't have that type of time this year. So now we're going to look at the concept uh, of atomic structure in terms of the number of particles that are present. And we've talked about ions previously, and earlier today I mentioned the word isotopes. So what happens to an atom if it gains or loses an electron? Well, it turns into an ion. What if it gains or loses a proton? Well, it turns into a different element. But what if it gains or loses a neutron? It's still the same element. It's just a different isotope of that element, meaning it has different mass. So this is what a typical symbol on the periodic table might look like. You've got the element symbol, you know, O for oxygen. Now it will list a smaller whole number, which is called the atomic number. Most people refer to this with the letter Z, and it will also list something that we call the atomic mass. Now, the atomic mass is the same thing as the molar mass numerically, just with a different unit. The atomic mass is the mass of, you know, an atom, so AMU. This is an average mass, actually. Or in the idea of having a whole mole of it, it's the number of grams per mole of that element. Now, often we write symbols that look like this, where we'll have the, you know, the mg for the element. And if it's charged, if it's an ion, we put that as a superscript in the upper right. And then on the left side, on the bottom, we put the atomic number, number of protons. And then we put a mass number. Now the mass number is not the same thing as the atomic mass. The atomic mass is an average, but the mass number is always a whole number. And it represents the number of protons and neutrons in that specific isotope. So it will always have to be a whole number because you can't have half a neutron. It doesn't work that way. So the atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus. The atomic mass is the average mass of all the isotopes of an element. And the mass number is the number of protons and neutrons together 
in a specific isotope, in one specific atom. Pause this as necessary. Okay, let's fill in the table. Let's look at carbon. On the periodic table, atomic number is six. Now, it gives an atomic mass on the table, which is 12.011. For us, we'll round that off to 12. So the specific isotope of carbon we're talking about is carbon 12. It has six protons. Now we'll have six neutrons because 12 minus the atomic number is six. And it has six electrons. Now for the isotope, I'm sorry, for the ion, Mg2+, it has an atomic number of 12. We get that from the periodic table. On the periodic table, it says 24.31. We'll round that down and we'll choose a mass number of 24. It has 12 protons, it has 12 neutrons. Now, it doesn't actually have 12 electrons. It has 10 because it's a 2 plus. It's lost two electrons. So, in this case, we could have had a different answer. We could have also had a mass number 25. It would have 12 protons, but instead of 12 neutrons, it would have had 13. Okay, how about Br minus? Atomic number 35, a mass number of 80. It would have 35 protons, 45 neutrons, but since it has a minus one charge, it has 36 neutrons. And you're going to be doing a lot of this in your homework. Okay. Now, we're going to look this time at three different isotopes of hydrogen, which have the scientific names of protium, deuterium, and tritium. Now, hydrogen one is protium. Atomic number one, mass number one, one proton, no neutrons, one electron. But deuterium, still atomic number one, still mass number one, still one proton. But deuterium also has a neutron. So just one electron. And for tritium, which has a mass number of three, there are actually two neutrons present. Okay, so we should talk about why the number on the periodic table is not a whole number. Atomic mass is an average mass. How do we determine these? Well, scientifically, I mean, in the laboratory, there's a device called a mass spectrometer that can do that. And we're not going to get into how the mass spectrometer works so much, okay, in here. But let's just suffice it to say, it can determine that. Now, bromine. Bromine's a great example for this. Bromine exists primarily as two isotopes. Bromine 81, which is about 45% of naturally occurring bromine, and bromine 79, which is about 55% of naturally occurring bromine. So we can't just add up 81 and 79 and divide by two and get a mass of 80. Our table says 79.9. Okay, so how is it that we're going to use this information to actually determine that mass? Okay, in general, when you want to find an average, you just add the numbers up and divide by how many numbers there are. Okay, but that is assuming that all of those numbers are of equal value, they're equally weighted. But we can't do that here because we might have a higher percentage of one isotope than the other. So we have to do what is called a weighted average. Okay? So let's imagine that we have 100 atoms of bromine. Now, we have 100 atoms and 45 are 81. 45 out of 100 is 0.45 or 45%. And 55 out of 100 are bromine 79, 0.55, that was 55%. So we take the 0.45 times 81, 
and then add that to 0.55 times 79. And that gives us 79.9. And that's where that number came from on the periodic table. So I want to finish this out today with a question. There are things that I've told you about today that actually don't make sense. If protons are positive and electrons are negative, shouldn't they all just be pulled straight into the nucleus and combine with the protons to form neutrons? Why do they stay orbiting, as Rutherford said? We also said that the nucleus is very small, really, really, really tiny. And if you have all of those protons together in the nucleus, and they all have the same charge, why aren't they repelling each other? Why isn't the nucleus like exploding at the speed of light? Okay, so everything we've talked about today, you agreed with, and that's good because you know we're not really lying to you. But there's got to be more to the picture, more for us to understand. I want you to think about that before the next lecture. Okay, thanks for tuning in. This is Morgan signing off.